Actually, I, um, yeah, it's, good. it's my husband's turn to talk. He's amazing. I figured yeah, that's why you guys came, was to hear him talk. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to take up any more time at this moment. And I'm going to um, go ahead and let him get up here and explain his story to you. So thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, dude. Hi, I'm Jeff. <laughs> I'm the second born in a family of five, and I also have four half-sisters. I had a bit of experience at my first church I went to when I was younger. I can remember wearing a green suit for my baptism and having holy water poured over my head. And that I had new godparents that I saw very occasionally. What really stood out to me about my experience at that church was that even in those pre-COVID times, everyone seemed to keep their distance. It came across to me as more of a pageant. Other people seemed to say, our clothes are nicer than yours. Our car is nicer than yours. <clears throat> uh, not really welcoming or loving in any way. Actually kind of cold. I made my first communion and where we were required to come to catechism classes, and again, the kids that were already a part of that program kind of frowned on us. I remember that it was about the time for my confirmation and my mother said if we wanted to stop going to church, we could. So at around age 12, my brothers and I <clears throat> stopped going. Church at that time, to me, was something we walked a mile to on Sunday mornings. It was more of an obligation than a choice. At that time, I thought of it as once a week thing I had to do, and I can't say that I thought of it as spiritual or otherwise moving. I listened to a lot of music and rode my bike and or played baseball or kicked the can with the kids in the neighborhood until the sun went down. And my dad called us home with a whistle loud enough to hear from forever away. Sometime around that, I started having seizures. I spent what seems like months in the hospital and was diagnosed with having compulsive disorder, a mild form of epilepsy, phenobarbital and dilantin twice a day from sixth grade till I was 23 became my daily routine. And all but my metal head friends seemed to disappear. I sang and tried to play bass in a KISS cover band around age 14. I spent most of my time, teen years drawing logos of the bands I daydreamed of one day having. Kids in school would often ask for my autograph just in case. <clears throat> Later in high school, I would occasionally drink way too much for whatever reason most likely because I never liked the taste of that drink or that night's drink of choice. I would drink whatever it was way too fast and either black out or vomit profusely. I wrote for my friend's band White Cross at the Parma Senior High School talent show, and I knew that night that roading wasn't enough for me. And though I was ridiculously shy, go figure, no matter what, I had to be up on stage, not watching from the light board. Around age 21, a friend and frontman of a popular area cover band told me and another vocalist it was time to separate the men from the boys. I had just recently joined his band Fastlane for a live performance of the song Oh Well, and the crowd roared. I tried out for a local cover band called Hard Driver, and though I had the flu during my audition, my take on Led Zeppelin's The Ocean won me the gig. We did a few shows, but I wanted more. I fronted a couple of metal cover bands, whether in Cleveland or in New Orleans, where I fronted a band called White Heat, and no, it wasn't the hair metal band. After a while, I again hungered for more. I called my drummer from my first series Cleveland metal band called An Eye for an Eye and told him I was coming home. We formed Purgatory and made an EP and an album and toured regionally. <clears throat> Though I found the band, I was fired, and to show that they were wrong, I formed my first solo band, Hatrix. Our songs were mostly from the perspective of being a serial killer, because I had a lot of pen-up pen -up anger. <clears throat> During this time, I drifted between being an atheist and agnostic. 
not really sure what I was doing, either denying or at least doubting the existence of God or any higher power. Going through life burning the candle at both ends, to say the very least. During on and off, drinking on and off and rock starring it up. Mushroom was born in 1992 and we hit the stage for the first time on October 23rd, 1993 to a small smattering of applause. A week later, we opened for the Shack Rock Kings Guar and it was off to the races. Outselling the biggest bands of the time at the local record stores and opening for a who's who of the top metal draws. Somewhere in the blur of success, power corrupted. Show sets stayed basically the same for a decade. And that surge of adrenaline of being on stage every night went from thrill to watching excited fans wondering why they thought tonight might be different. I went from having one to two shots of Jaeger pre-show because one, it coated my throat, and two, let go of my inhibitions, to drinking a third to a half of the bottle. In an attempt to sedate away the disappointment of the faces of fans crying out for a little variety instead of the same night after night song list. No matter how many times I asked for a different, my destroyed hearing and my opinions stopped mattering long ago. Even though I co-founded a band, I became relatively invisible and drinking made it seem less terrible. Fast forward to February 24th, 2012. I was home tracking demos for my solo band, Jeffrey Nothing, and there was a Mushroom Head show scheduled for the next day at Midway Mall, a half MMA, half metal show extravaganza. Though it was late, I told the promoter I could give them half an hour. I showed up at Wasabi, and after about 10 minutes passed, Stacy Santiago came over from her job at Harry Buffalo, hoping to meet the band. <laughs> and get some autographs. I, as luck would have it, was looking for girls to be in my still unreleased video for my solo band song, Enough. She thankfully said yes, and though it was love at first sight, I fell in love with her words during the week between meeting and filming. We were married between us on May 12th of that year and officially on June 7th, 2013. Within the band, outside appearances looked great, but it was actually years of emotional abuse and disrespect. This treatment was made worse as my family was also disrespected regularly. I started thinking about leaving the band and stay for the fans more than anything until it became impossible to put up with it. Stacy saved me long before I was fully saved. She's my everything and I'm blessed to know true love and her family welcomed me and showed me what real faith really is. We spent a lot of time with her grandma, Margaret Carter. She raised Stacy, and their faith was and is so strong. Prior to that, I prayed a couple times in my life and felt I was heard, but until I met my wife, I didn't realize what prayer really was all about. Cathedral of Life was... <clears throat> Stacy's family church when she was growing up <clears throat> and her Aunt Becky asked if we would come to the church to support her cousin Troy on Sunday night and we didn't hesitate. I love music and I was watching and listening to the worship when I saw a woman holding her young daughter. I thought it was amazing as a girl would sing whatever words she knew. I smiled and I really stopped smiling that whole evening. This church was already so different than any I'd ever known. Some time passed and we got the news that Stacy would need another surgery, so I asked her if she wanted to start going to church. It felt good when we went with her cousin and I felt that she would like to go. We came to church, I believe, that Wednesday night and have been coming one to three times a week ever since. I truly feel that faith can move mountains. I pray every night now. <clears throat> and I believe with all my heart that having God in my life has changed everything for the better. I love being a part of the Cathedral Life Church family. 
helping with video production and completely feeling that we were home. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. When things get hard, I pray. When bad things are happening and I'm stressed out, I start praying and it helps. My love, Stacy, and I spent Friday night in the Cleveland Clinic ER. My right temple was swollen and I had headaches there too. The headaches had been there on and off for weeks, accompanied by an earache sensation sometimes after chewing. My grandfather and aunt both passed away because of aneurysms, so I don't take any chances. It could have been temporal arteritis, which can lead to vision loss, stroke, or aneurysms. Five and a half hours after checking blood pressure in a CAT scan later, it was due to muscle swelling. I prayed the whole time. I prayed the whole time I was laying there. It comforted me knowing it was all in God's hands. Thank you. Sorry for getting choked up. <laughs> that's good, that's good.